can I just quickly check the audio feed on the BBC? Are they off mute, Margot? Yeah, cool. Yeah, say something and then we'll check.
Good afternoon and welcome to today's Downing Street press conference. I'm pleased to be joined today by Professor Jonathan Van Tam. Let me start by updating you on the latest information from the government's COBRA data file. I can report through the government's monitoring and testing program as of today, 1,728,443 tests for coronavirus have now been carried out in the UK, including 96,878 tests yesterday. 215,260 people have been tested positive. That's an increase of 3,896 cases since yesterday. 11,809 people are currently in hospital with coronavirus in the UK, down from 12,284 yesterday and 17% down since the last day last week, same day last week. And tragically, 31,587 people have now died. That's an increase of 346 fatalities in all settings since yesterday. These deaths are devastating for the families, and friends, and victims, and our thoughts and our prayers are with all of them every day. They also strengthen our resolve to fight the pandemic with all the resources we can muster in the weeks ahead. Tomorrow, the Prime Minister will set out a roadmap for the next phase in our strategy to tackle coronavirus. In support of this today, I'm setting out an ambitious programme to help prepare our transport network for the critical role it will play as we emerge from this crisis. Importantly, it is true to say that moving beyond COVID will be a gradual process, not a single leap to freedom. So when we do emerge, the world will seem quite different, at least for some time. The need to maintain social distancing means that our public transport system cannot go back to where it left off. And here is a very stark fact. Even with public transport reverting to a full service, once you take into account the two metre social distancing rule, there would only be effective capacity for one in 10 passengers in many parts of our network, just a tenth of the old capacity. So getting Britain moving again while not overcrowding our transport network is going to require many of us to think very carefully about how and when we travel. We've accomplished so much over the past seven weeks of this lockdown. The whole country has been responsible for reducing COVID reproduction or the R rate. Millions of households across the UK have changed their behaviour for the greater good. Getting Britain moving again whilst not overcrowding our transport network represents an another, another enormous logistical challenge. Yet this is a problem which presents a health opportunity too an opportunity to make lasting changes that could not only make us fitter, but also better off, both mentally and physically, in the long run. During the crisis, millions of people, millions of people, have discovered the benefits of active travel. By cycling or walking, many have been able to appreciate this remarkably warm summer, uh, sorry, spring, whilst sticking to the guidelines. In some places, there's been a 70% rise in the number of people on bikes, uh, whether that's for exercise, or necessary journeys, uh, like stocking up on food. So whilst it's crucial that we stay at home, when the country does get back to work, we need to ask those people to carry on cycling and walking and for them to be joined by many others as well. Otherwise, with public transport capacity severely restricted, more cars could be drawn to the roads of our towns and cities and they would quickly become gridlocked. We also know that in this new world, pedestrians will need more space. So today, I'm announcing a £2 billion package to put cycling and walking at the heart of our transport policy. To set out how we deliver this, we'll bring forward a national cycling plan for publication in early June, uh, in line with the statutory cycle and walking investment strategy to help double cycling and increase walking by 2025. The first stage, worth £250 million, is a series of swift emergency interventions to make cycling and walking safer. Pop-up bike lanes, wider pavements, cycle and bus only streets, all examples of what people will start to see more of. And accompanying the new money, we are, we are today publishing fast track statutory guidance, effective immediately 
requiring councils in England to cater for significantly increased numbers of cyclists uh, and pedestrians and making it easier for them to create safer seat, uh, streets. For employees who want to start to cycle to work uh, but don't have a bike right now, the popular cycle to work scheme already allows employees to save between 25 and 39% of the cost of a new bike or indeed electric bike. There's been a huge increase in people using this scheme and we'll work with employers to increase uptake even further. And for those who may have an old bike, perhaps in the shed, and want to get it back to a roadworthy condition, there'll be a voucher scheme for bike repairs and for maintenance. Plans are also being developed to boost uh, bike fixing facilities across the country. What's more, over the next few months, we'll set out further measures to make a once-in-a-generation change to the way that people travel in Britain. This will include tough new standards for cycling infrastructure, a new national cycling champion to inspire us, much closer links to the NHS with GPs prescribing cycling to help get us fitter, legal changes to protect vulnerable road users, at least one zero emission city with its centre restricted to bikes and electric vehicles only, and the creation of long-term cycling programme and budget, just like we have already for our roads. There's clear evidence, not least from the time that the Prime Minister was Mayor of London, that uh, making streets safe for walking and cycling is good for retailers, good for business, and very healthy for the economy. And in making these changes, our national recovery can also become a green recovery as a result. One of the few positive benefits of this crisis is drastically better air quality, the health benefits that that brings. More than 20,000 extra deaths a year in the UK are attributed to nitrogen dioxide emissions. We want to try to preserve this cleaner air. So today, I'm also fast-tracking trials of e-scooters, bringing this program already underway from next year forward to next month, and extending those trials to four, from four local authorities to every region in the country that wants them in a bid to get e-scooter rental schemes up and running in cities as fast as possible. Helping reduce car use on shorter journeys and taking, taking some of the pressure off the buses at this vital time. These trials will help us assess the safety benefits together with their impact on public spaces. Now we know that the car industry has of course been very badly hit during this crisis. But April's new sales figures showed us that for the first time ever that the two biggest selling models were both electric vehicles. So to keep this quiet, clean car revolution going, I can also announce today £10 million of additional support for car charging points on our streets. The car will remain the mainstay for many families as well as, uh, as uh, backing electric uh, infrastructure. Therefore, we're also going to accelerate the filling of potholes that plague so many road users in all the forms. And just as new technology is changing the vehicles we use, so digital technology will help us be more informed about the choices we make to battle against COVID. At a time when transport demand could quickly become overwhelmed, uh, the capacity not being there, uh, and there we need uh, urgent access to real-time travel information. It is crucial that we take advantage of the UK's digital expertise, therefore. With the right mobile apps, people can find out which parts of the transport network are overcrowded and avoid them. They can choose alternative travel options to help maintain safe distancing, or they can get information to help stagger their journeys and lift the burden on public transport at peak times. So this week I chaired a round table with key players like Google, Microsoft and British firm CityMapper to develop both data and apps to help the public view crowding across the transport network and in real time. This £2 billion announcement uh, represents the most significant package of cycling, walking and green travel by any British government. Clearly, it will never be possible to cycle, walk or even e-scooter everywhere. Cars will remain an absolutely vital form of transport to many. And so, in the coming days, I, and as we look to the future, there will be further announcements about the huge investments we're making in roads and in rail, taking advantage of the low usership during this COVID crisis. Finally, as we begin the process of preparing public transport to get Britain moving again, no one should underestimate the sheer scale of the challenge ahead. 
Even with every train, bus and tram fully restored to service, this will not be enough. Social distancing measures mean that everyone who travels will need to contribute to meeting this capacity challenge. Changing our behaviour is the single biggest thing that's beaten back this virus. The welcome fall we've seen in deaths is not only an achievement of the doctors and nurses and care workers, but everyone in the country for following the stay-at-home guidance. To reiterate, nothing I'm saying today changes these basic rules. But as we contemplate the future, we ha will have to carry on making changes, particularly after we leave our homes. Preventing overcrowding, which could lead to a second spike and more deaths, will be the responsibility of each and every one of us. So please, only travel when you need to, be considerate to others and help prioritise essential workers. And let's all play our part in ensuring that we're able to get Britain moving safely again when that time comes. I'd like to now turn to Professor John van Tan. Thank you and good afternoon. I'm, I'm going to uh, do the daily slide update now. So um, to remind you all again that our five tests for adjusting the lockdown are NHS capacity, a falling number of daily deaths, reliable data showing us that infections are decreasing, getting testing and PPE supply in exactly the right place, and being absolutely sure that we have the room to manoeuvre in such a way that we do not risk um, a second peak of infections that threatens the NHS. Those are and remain our five key points. Next slide, please. Now, on um, this slide, which shows transport use in Great Britain um, since the lockdown started on the 23rd of March until um, a couple of days ago, you can see that the British people have continued to be remarkable in showing enormous restraint in terms of travel. Um, the figures for buses, for tubes and for national rail are extremely impressive. If you look at the motor vehicle trend, the larger blue line at the top of the graph, you can see um, that there is a gradual increase over time. The trend is up. And um, this may reflect um, that some people are now returning to work who made the decision to stop at the beginning of lockdown, but, but were perhaps never obligated by the guidance to actually stop. So it's a difficult trend to interpret, um, but it is, it is slightly upwards. Next slide, please. Now this slide um, shows daily tests from the 6th of April to the 9th of May, and it is tests completed and sent out. And you can see that we are now really um, at a um, high plateau in the region of 100,000 tests per day. There is some fluctuation, and quite frankly, I expect there to be some fluctuation on a day-to-day -day basis. So I don't think we can read too much into individual day-to-day -day variations, but the macro picture is that this is now at a much, much higher level um, than it ever was at the beginning of this crisis. Next slide, please. On new cases, you can see the growing contribution of um, the Pillar 2 testing arm, uh, mass swab testing by universities, research institutes and companies, supplementing the blue columns, NHS swab testing. And you can see um, still that we are um, encountering several thousand uh, new cases per day. Now, this, these data are difficult to interpret because, of course, if you compare our testing capacity at the beginning of this pandemic to where we are now, we have so much more capacity now, and that will be reflected in our ability to detect more cases. So interpret the data here with um, a degree of care, please. Next slide, please. This slide um, is familiar to you again. You, you've seen it many times before. It is the number of people in hospital um, with coronavirus in the UK. And you can see now that broadly, nationwide, there is a solid decline um, right across the different regions. I am confident 
that um, R is less than 1 overall, um, that still means that we have to be very cautious and careful and measured about what happens next. Next slide, please. If you look at um, critical care beds um, and the occupancy, you can see that across the four nations, we have plenty of capacity uh, for managing patients who require critical care. And the proportion of those beds occupied by coronavirus patients continues to decline. Next slide, please. On deaths, you can see really since the middle of April that there has been and there continues to be a steady and consistent fall in the number of recorded deaths due to COVID-19 in the UK. Next slide, please. And then finally, this is the global death comparison that you have seen before. All lines um, begin on the bottom left-hand corner at a point when 50 cum cumulative deaths were recorded in each of the countries. And it continues to tell the story that I have illustrated to you in previous press conferences that um, the United States is an outlier at the top, that the UK is in company with France, Spain and Italy in the middle band, and there are other European countries and South Korea um, along the lower trajectory. These data are always difficult to interpret every time I want to say it, that we will not get the most granular picture until we start to get excess mortality data across all of these countries, and that will help us make a far more accurate comparison. Thank you, Secretary Drake. Jonathan, thank you very much. And I want to go to the first question from a member of the public, Stephen from County Durham. Good afternoon. I live in the northeast of England, 175 miles away from Edinburgh, and double that distance from London. Should I follow the advice of the First Minister for Scotland or that of Downing Street? Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Stephen. Well, look, the answer is actually, I think the, the, the four nations, Scotland, uh, uh, Wales, Northern Ireland and uh, England, have actually largely moved in uh, lockstep. You'll hear from the Prime Minister uh, tomorrow night at 7 p.m. Uh, and uh, we do want to, of course, make this as straightforward as people, as indeed this message uh, in front of me has been all the way through to stay home, uh, protect the NHS and save lives. And um, so the next phase of this will also involve some very clear messaging and you won't have to wait very long to uh, hear it either. So thank you very much, uh, Stephen. Turning to uh, Tammy uh, from Bristol, I think it's a written question. Uh, Tammy uh, asks, uh, opening schools and colleges is a very important topic for many people. But how do you plan to implement social distancing rules in education settings? Children, especially primary age and younger, will find it difficult to keep these rules. Well, it's a very uh, good point, of course. Um, again, to repeat, the first point is we need to wait to hear from the Prime Minister uh, tomorrow uh, night. Uh, but the wider point is, of course, there are ongoing discussions between uh, my uh, colleagues uh, in education uh, and schools, and teachers and the unions, uh, and, of course, uh, with uh, our scientists as well to work out the best way uh, to uh, bring schools back when that happens. Uh, but uh, Jonathan, perhaps I can ask you to comment. Yes. Um, so the point the, um, uh, that, that Tammy is making is that um, young children are, do find it difficult um, to keep rules, any kind of touching or distancing rules. And th that's an accepted fact. We've, we've all encountered young children and we completely understand that. What I can say is that whatever the Prime Minister announces that we will do next, um, it is going to be extremely cautious and extremely careful and extremely painstaking. And it has to take into account the kind of factors that have been mentioned in the question. And indeed, that, ad that advice and that policy will do that. But it's caution all the way, really. I think that's, that's absolutely right in answer to Tammy. Extreme caution is actually uh, the watchword uh, on this. And we've seen in other countries uh, where um, second, uh, not quite spikes have come along, but where uh, social distancing has been relaxed and there have been problems. So we will wait to see. Can I turn now to Ben Wright of the BBC? Thank you. Uh, Secretary of State, can you confirm that anyone flying into UK airports will be told to quarantine for 14 days 
from the start of next month. Uh, a lot of people will wonder why this wasn't done weeks ago during the peak of the pandemic, and won't such a move damage the aviation industry even more? Thank you very much, Ben. Well, look, um, throughout this crisis, and particularly at the beginning, and particularly in reference to that question, we've sought and taken uh, medical uh, advice. In fact, I remember asking the chief medical advisor uh, exactly uh, about this point. The, the thing is that very few people are travelling by comparison to normal, and particularly at the beginning of this crisis. Most of them were Brits returning from ab abroad, possibly uh, it ranging in the numbers of about 3 million in that time. Others would be permanent residents here, and of course, essential workers who are providing fixes for uh, uh, freight and supply and medical equipment who we'd need to and want to have uh, travelling. So the medical advice didn't support it. But I think it's worth pointing out, we did, in fact, close off uh, uh, quarantine. Uh, anyone from uh, Wuhan in January, uh, from Iran, northern Italy, and South Korea in February, uh, which uh, uh, people may have not have realised uh, at the time. Um, but now we have a situation where, as we get the R number, the reproduction number, down in the UK, and we begin to get things uh, under control, uh, and uh, it, we now have the capacity, as we just discussed in testing as well, it clearly then makes sense to look at what happens at the borders. Um, I can't confirm is the answer. We'll have to wait for the Prime Minister tomorrow night, Ben, um, but it does mean uh, that the capacity to do those things uh, exists, but also that the science would back it as well. I'm just going to ask Jonathan Van Tam to comment on the science of it as well. Yes, yeah, so I'm just going to comment on the science of quarantine and leave the announcements um, for, for later. Um, the incubation period of this disease is very clearly understood to be between 1 and 14 days. That is to say, from the point of a critical exposure to the virus, you remain well for from one day to 14 days before your symptoms emerge. And typically, the mean incubation period is five days. So that would be a typical wait, if you like, between when you were exposed and you became infected through to when you get symptoms. If people go home, um, as we ask them to do when they return from Wuhan at the end of January, and they stay in their own homes for 14 days, even if they were infected very shortly before they came into the UK, then they work out that incubation period at home, and they do not spread the virus onwards into the community. So that's the scientific basis of how quarantine would work in this circumstance. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Jonathan. And I, I would add then, but I'll come back to you. Um, I think having, uh, bearing in mind the sacrifice the British people have made this last seven weeks and uh, counting, we can't have a situation where everyone else is being asked to stay at home, but others could come into the, into the country. It's also worth pointing out that the numbers coming to the country are, are very, very uh, small, but it is a question of, of that judgment. Ben, can I go back to you? Yeah, just on the sort of the clarity of the message. On the one hand, you're now talking about quarantining people, which is a, a tightening of restrictions. On the other hand, saying to people they can now go and visit garden centres, which is a loosening of the lockdown rules. I just wonder if the government's messaging strategy isn't now looking more confused. No, I think that most people are, are more than sort of capable of understanding uh, uh, what's meant. And as the first secretary uh, said when he announced the five uh, principles of the NHS coping, making sure that deaths are consistently falling, making sure the R rate is uh, falling, that we have the capacity for the test, and most importantly of all, that we don't then have another uh, spike when we change social distancing. And he said at that time, there will be some places where we will wish to tighten. There'll be other places, of course, where social uh, distancing or our, our, our habits or the message uh, may change or loosen. So I think it's completely consistent uh, with the plan. Uh, but as I say, uh, you will have to wait till um, we actually have formal announcements on any of this uh, uh, before any of that's confirmed. Thank you very much. Sorry, Jonathan, uh, maybe, maybe I could add just that, um, as I understand it, um, the policy is actually still quite consistent. We've announced um, testing and tracing um, that, that will um, roll out in due course, and that will mean that um, we identify cases and we ask contacts to go into home isolation for 14 days, just the same as um, would apply if somebody crossed our border. So from that perspective, I think there is a real consistency here. And the difference you're hinting at is a kind of blunderbuss approach of it applies to everybody, 
versus, hopefully, a more filtered way of doing exactly the same thing. Ben, thank you very much uh, indeed. Can we turn to uh, Carl Dinan from ITV? Thank you, Secretary of State. Uh, the airlines and the airline industry fear that they won't have an industry left if this lockdown and these quarantine arrangements uh, continue for any great length of time. Can you confirm whether you are still open to negotiation uh, on this quarantine arrangement uh, with the airlines and the industry, or have you made up your mind? I would say nothing has been announced uh, at all as yet, in, in fact, uh, and we will have to wait for those uh, announcements. But I just want to say with regard to the aviation sector, because you're absolutely right, uh, when it comes to, uh, if you think about sectors that have been affected, obviously leisure, entertainment, those sort of things, and aviation would be right up there uh, with them. And it's both a short-term problem, people aren't flying now, uh, and a, a longer-term recovery uh, issue for them. So it's worth just recalling that the uh, Chancellor has made some very, very important packages available, not just furloughing of staff, uh, but also the loans that have been made available. But actually also in addition to that, uh, the Chancellor and I have approached the entire aviation sector and said, look, if, if those things don't work, if that doesn't fit the bill, uh, then for this sector, because we recognise what's happening, uh, you can get into bespoke uh, conversations and that is happening in a, a number of different aviation cases. But I mean, it is undeniably the case, of course, that aviation has been uh, right at the forefront uh, of this. We have to, first and foremost, make sure that we develop policy uh, in the public interest. And that, of course, as everybody knows, is protecting the NHS and saving lives. Uh, do you want to come back on that, Carl? I wanted to ask about uh, your announcement on cycling, actually. The, the extra investment in cycling would be very welcome for those who are able to cycle to work. But as you will know, the average commute in this country is nearly nine miles. There are many people who just can't cycle to work, even if they want to. And you've admitted that all the transport, public transport capacity won't be enough if it's brought back online. What are you doing about that? Yeah, I mean, you raise an excellent point, and I hope that in my comments I covered it a little bit in saying that I'm going to come back and talk about um, the infrastructure investment on roads and so on and so forth. Absolutely recognise that car will be a vital part of uh, what's required. But I do just want to kind of pick you up on one stat. Um, outside of London, uh, it's been shown that half of journeys uh, are under three miles. So you don't have to be a cyclist to benefit from society as a whole switching to cycling or walking. So to give you a, an idea of what that meant, if only 5% of those journeys uh, were, were cycling, so if I, cycling increased by 5%, I should say, it would mean 8 million fewer car journeys, 9 million fewer rail journeys, and 13 million fewer bus journeys. And that's just a 5% increase in um, cycling. So you don't have to be the cyclist to benefit from that, uh, and that's why I was saying in my comments, uh, I very much like people to be thinking about alternative and active forms of transport today in order to protect the uh, total amount of public transport that will be available once you include social distancing uh, within it. Carl, I can come back to you if you wanted to respond. Uh, well, that, that still doesn't quite answer the question about public transport capacity, which, as you've indicated, is going to be a, a very, very serious problem, especially in the southeast of England, of course, but all around the country. Yeah. So there is no simple answer. And I, look, I'm, I'm here to sort of just give it to you straight. There is no simple answer. If you, if you think about the figure of only space for one in 10 commuters if you keep social distancing, which, of course, we must, and Professor Van Tam will tell us why, uh, then it does restrict space, which is why I'm here today providing some notice um, that uh, it's very important that we all think about how we get about. And when you think about that figure of, you know, uh, almost half of journeys being just three miles, it's quite clear that there are other ways that uh, people could travel quite a bit of the time. And even if you're not a cyclist or a walker, it would help the whole of uh, society. Thank you very much indeed. Can I turn to uh, Ben Kentish from LBC? Good afternoon. Thank you, uh, Transport Secretary. Given the quarantine arrangements we've been talking about and the other uncertainty about travel, can you level with people today? And the, given the uncertainty facing the tourism and tourism industry and individuals, say to people that realistically foreign travel this summer is going to be highly unlikely. And would you advise people even now to start cancelling trips? And just secondly, if I may, to Professor Van Tam. It's become clear, it has been for some weeks now, that the driving force of this epidemic is now really transmission within care homes. 
Olympics. I just wanted to ask, why has it been so difficult to protect some of the most vulnerable people in our society, those at highest risk from this disease, i.e. people in care homes? And what more, if anything, do you think needs to be done to achieve that? Thank you. Thank you very much, Ben. Um, look, on summer holidays, um, it is a fact at the moment, unfortunately, that the advice hasn't changed. We have to stay at home, so you can't travel around this country at the minute. That advice, uh, we, we will have to wait uh, to see if it's updated. In terms of international travel, of course, the Foreign Commonwealth Office uh, is recommending advising strongly against all um, travel uh, internationally at the moment. And people will, of course, have to have that in their minds uh, before they're able to uh, book anything. Of course, also in countries where people might normally go to visit, they're also not accepting uh, people in, in many uh, cases. Um, so it's difficult to give blanket advice. The situation is as it is at the moment. And we will have to see how the uh, reproductive rate of uh, COVID-19 continues to uh, proceed before we'll know uh, the answer from here, uh, standing here at the beginning of May, uh, to know how that will look in the uh, summer. And on uh, care homes, that was to you, Jonathan. Yes, thank you for the question. Look, I, I recognise that there um, has and continues to be um, a difficult situation in care homes. And I'm extremely sorry um, for the um, many deaths that have occurred. However, care homes are a really difficult situation from um, a basic infection control and epidemiology point of view. First of all here, we are dealing with a virus that is very infectious. Um, the R0, if left unchecked, is somewhere between 2.8 and 3. It's high. Um, we are dealing with care homes with a largely indoor environment, and we do know that this and many other respiratory viruses spreads more easily in indoor environments. We are also dealing with, um, by and large, a very elderly population in care homes. And um, my colleagues who run the COSIN analysis um, are very clear that there is a, an independent effect of age on the risks of COVID and the severity and the death rate. And that is now very, very clear indeed. And roughly with each 10-year age band, it goes up and up. And um, on top of being elderly, many of the um, people living in care homes have other underlying conditions. And again, the analyses are very clear that um, you have um, increased risk of, of complicated disease, increased risks of death, again, associated with a range of underlying conditions. So you almost have the perfect storm of a, a really nasty virus that's infectious, a very elderly population, and we know age increases risk, um, a population with many underlying um, illnesses, risk conditions, that again further increase risk, and to an extent, an indoor environment. So it's just a very challenging place, uh, place to work in. Now, in terms of um, what is being done about it, my colleagues at uh, NHS England and um, the um, Care Quality Commission are now um, really putting an enormous amount of effort into solving these problems and giving as much advice and support as they physically can. Jonathan, thank you very much. Um, ben, thank you uh, as well. Uh, turning now to Nigel Nelson, Sunday Mirror. Um, yes, uh, uh, thank you, Secretary of State. Um, as a follow-up to Tammy's question, would you accept that parents won't be able to cycle into work until schools are fully up and running? And also to Jonathan Van Tam, what's going to happen to the 1.8 million shielding when the volunteers they rely on also go back to work. Nigel, thanks very much. I mean, I think you rightly point out the interconnectivity of our economy and also uh, this enormous and unprecedented situation we find ourselves in. Um, I think it is true to say that people 
have, through this um, uh, crisis, have found a lot of different ways of working. And many more people than ever thought it was possible have discovered they've been able to uh, work from um, home. Uh, and I imagine that quite a lot of that will continue, and possibly for quite some time, particularly as social distancing uh, remains at the heart of uh, making sure that we proceed with extreme caution, which is absolutely uh, our desire. So, uh, look, it, it, of course it is the case that all of these things have to fit together. They have to fit together in a certain pace, uh, so schools going back, work going back, and so on and so forth. And it is why, uh, if I may say, that the Prime Minister will be speaking to us at 7 p.m. tomorrow night to set out how that roadmap will fit together in the medium term. Uh, and uh, to you on the second point. So, um, thank you for the question. Um, shielding is an extremely important part of what we've been doing um, to protect the most vulnerable in our society um, during the first part of this pandemic. Um, I believe it's likely to have had a major effect on the um, number of severe cases um, in the shielded population. I believe it's likely to have pre prevented many deaths in that population. We do keep the shielded groups under review, and we do keep how we are going to move forwards with the shielding policy under review. But I can tell you that um, nothing we will do in the future will ever sacrifice the public health and clinical importance of continuing to protect the most vulnerable people in our society. Jonathan, thanks. Nigel, did you want to come back? Uh, only just, uh, just to check the, the order of events, which is what I was trying to ask about, um, that without um, schools, wraparound childcare, breakfast clubs, school clubs, then the whole idea of starting to talk about people going back to work uh, is a bit premature. And so I'm just trying to see if you, if you would agree that schools are the priority mm. before we can do the next stage. In, in a sense, I'm trying to actually raise this subject ahead of time. Uh, Nigel, because uh, as I described in my comments, I think it's very important that people are starting to think about the reality of how journeys may need to work uh, in the future. Uh, so you're right to say uh, that this is sort of projecting forward rather than something uh, which is right now at this moment. Um, but the, uh, as I say, if I can just you know, appeal to your patience for just over 24 hours to hear from the Prime Minister tomorrow, uh, I feel you'll be in a much happier position about how that all fits together as he presents us with that roadmap. Can I turn now to Toby Helm from The Observer? Hello. Uh, question, first of all, for Secretary of State. Um, last week, uh, a number of media outlets, including the BBC, were confidently asserting that uh, the government would drop its stay-at-home message uh, when the Prime Minister makes his announcement tomorrow. Uh, more recently and since then, uh, there's been a much stronger ev evidence on how cautious the government wants to be, which would suggest perhaps that uh, it's not going to drop its stay-at-home message. Um, we are in the middle of a bank holiday weekend, very sunny weather. I know you'll try and say that the Prime Minister, you must wait for the Prime Minister's statement tomorrow, but there's more than 24 hours to go, and a lot of people will be wanting to get out into the parks and to have a good time. And from my own straw polls, I've, I've heard a lot of people saying already that they think the, li the lockdown basically is going, so they might as well go out. Could you tell people um, before tomorrow, and they have to make the decision what to do, should they be staying at home or should they not be staying at home? Toby, it's, it's just absolutely unequivocal. People should stay at home. Please follow the guidance. It's, it's still written here. That hasn't changed. Uh, and it's vital that we don't throw away, essentially, the great work of seven weeks of people respecting uh, very impressively uh, the, the, the rules and the guidelines uh, by throwing it away because it happens to be sunny outside this weekend. That would be absolutely tragic. And when, as uh, we hear the Prime Minister, and as I've tried to suggest in, in my comments uh, earlier, uh, that does change, we will have to proceed with an un unbelievable degree of caution. We will not be able to simply go back to business as usual or transport as usual uh, in my case. So uh, your point is very well made and the answer is simple. Please stay at home this weekend uh, in exactly the usual way that you have been uh, previously. Okay, could I just um, fire one at Professor Van Tam as well? Um, we've talked to lots of 
uh, scientists who confidently said that in order for the government's track and trace um, system to be effective and in fact for it to operate really at all, the numbers of new infections have got to have come down into their hundreds. Now, they seem to be hovering around 4,000 at the moment. Do you um, agree with those scientists that for the track and trace to really work, um, we have to have new cases of COVID-19 down in the hundreds? And if so, how long do you think that will take? Okay. So, um, test and trace is going to be a system that involves the NHS app and it is also going to involve Public Health England in wider traditional contract tracing using telephones, foot leather epidemiology and um, the way it's always been done for, for many years. Now, those two together make a package of test and trace and we have been very clear um, that test and trace on its own is part of the solution to how we continue to live with this virus after the lockdown that we're in at the moment. It's not the total solution. And um, how, how, let me try and get this right, how extensive the um, test and tracing needs to be clearly depends upon the level of disease in the population. But it is entirely appropriate to see it as part of the overall measures that will give us more flexibility and more room on what we can do in the social distancing space to ease things. But on its own, it's a contribution. It is not a total solution. Jonathan, thank you very much. And, and Toby, I can also tell you, I, I know that the trials in the Isle of Wight of that uh, tracking Oh, uh, app, the uh, NHS X app, uh, designed to help uh, assist people is going well. Uh, people have been downloading it enthusiastically, uh, and I know uh, that the plan is later in the month to make it more widely available as well. Can I turn to uh, Shaila Shalanka from Easter Eye? Thank you, Secretary of State. The latest ONS figures show that members of the Black South Asian community are dying in significantly high numbers from the coronavirus. Most live in extended families and are key workers. The government inquiry will report at the end of the month, but in the interim, what practical steps has the government undertaken to protect South Asian key workers and their families? Secondly, if I'm, secondly one more question, please. Um, secondly, we know from our sister publications, Asian Trader and Pharmacy Business, that over 75% of all convenience stores and 50% of community pharmacies nationally are owned by the Asian community. We know pharmacists are key workers, but will the government consider including convenience retailers as key workers and provide them and pharmacists with good quality PPE so they can continue to serve the nation? Or as some of our readers have suggested, would the government rather see convenience stores and community pharmacies close so they could stay alive? Thank you very much indeed, Charles. Um, look, I think we're very concerned uh, about uh, deaths amongst minority communities, the South Asian community uh, uh, included, um, and we're very, very uh, interested to understand why that is happening. Uh, and uh, at the moment, we're unclear whether that is just the proximity, in other words, uh, that more people from minority backgrounds happen to work in health and social care, uh, or whether there's something else going on. Uh, it actually opens up wider questions as, as well beyond this of, you know, why it is that uh, men are much more likely uh, to have higher mortality rates, or uh, obesity seems to be a factor, and many other things besides. Um, so we have asked uh, Professor Fenton, from the uh, Public Health England uh, to uh, look into this and carry out a quick study. Uh, results, as you mentioned, will be uh, at the end of May, and I think we'll all be in a much better position to understand this better. But be in no doubt at all, we are absolutely determined to get to, the, to, to, a, to a proper understanding uh, of what has been going on there. Uh, and in, in uh, relation to your uh, second point about um, uh, uh, ownership of uh, whether that's uh, stores or, or pharmacies, um, look, I think everybody on the front line uh, 
uh, are key workers. They are keeping this country running at this incredibly difficult time. And it applies to people in many different sectors, but you've mentioned two, which are you know, first amongst uh, equals. Uh, and of course, we want to get the right uh, protection for people in different settings. We know that in a health setting, the PPE required is of a different uh, level. Uh, it might be best for me to, therefore, as a medical sort of question, uh, ask uh, Jonathan to comment on this. Yes, thank, thank you, Secretary of State. I'll, I'll pick up on the um, question of um, black and minority ethnic groups in the ONS report. Thank you for the question. Um, I've read that report. I take it very seriously indeed, and there is an enormous determination across um, the medical advisory function for the government to get to the bottom of this and get to the bottom of it with real clarity. And that's why I don't want to come on here today and um, offer you kind of silly quick fixes. This is a complex mixture of risk by age, risk by gender, risk by comorbidities, other illnesses. There is a, an obesity signal beginning to emerge as well. And on top of that, and I'm absolutely clear, there is a signal around black and minority ethnic groups. No one, I think, is um, trying to brush that under the carpet or say it's not there, but it is complicated. And to give you some idea of that complexity, right now I can't um, stand in front of you and say that I could easily make a, an on-the-hoof judgment about who is more at risk a um, somebody from the black and minority ethnic community um, who is um, svelte, age 50, a regular half marathon runner, eats well, does everything right, versus um, somebody who is from a white ethnic group who is 32, who is um, extremely overweight, doesn't exercise, has diabetes, has asthma, etc., etc. Those are just silly examples, but they're ones that I hope give you an understanding that pitching the risk um, for individuals is quite a difficult and technically um, involved thing to do. And that's why I don't want to make any you know, quick jumps and quick um, quips of, as, of answers to you. I'd rather say to you that we are taking this incredibly seriously and we are determined to get to the bottom of it in a proper and scientific way. Charles, I just want to be absolutely um, back up what Jonathan said. We absolutely will be led by the science um, on this, find out what's going wrong, and we owe it to everybody uh, who's put themselves on the front lines uh, to find out uh, exactly what's happened. Did you want to come back in? Y yes, I do. Thank you. We appreciate that it's a hugely complex issue, and given that the inquiry was first announced on the 16th of April, it's going to announce now its findings on the end of May. People are actually dying now. There's a great deal of anxiety within BME communities, and all they're asking for is practical advice, practical steps as to what the government is doing to protect these lives. There's a huge amount of anxiety. Yes, indeed. And, and look, we need to get to the facts to understand this. Um, but I think the, the advice would actually be the same uh, as the advice all round, washing hands, making sure that appropriate PPE, to go into your second question, in the right circumstances uh, is, uh, is worn. Um, and uh, as I say, you know, bluntly, finding out what is actually going on. And uh, uh, that is a, a very rapid uh, piece of work that's uh, going on. And I'm sure we'll be hearing from Professor Fenton the moment uh, he can bring um, some clarity uh, to exactly what uh, has happened. Jonathan, I don't think there's anything else you no, can I, add to that. I just can't tell you how urgent it is, yeah. but I can also tell you it's not so urgent that we want to make mistakes and we want to be very, very clear about the science with you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Shailish. And uh, I just wanted to just finish by um, saying I talked a lot about the uh, future uh, this afternoon and some of the measures that will come into place. But please, this advice hasn't changed. Wait for the Prime Minister uh, tomorrow night to set out the roadmap uh, going forward. What I would ask you to do, regardless, is think about the future, about alternative and active means of transport. But we will be proceeding with extreme caution maintaining social distancing as one of the absolute key ways to beat this virus uh, in order that we can get Britain moving again. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.